right? The uh, author and the author's assistant. Exactly. <laughs> really? Yes, yeah, really. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so when it comes to maritime history, pretty much in general, but specifically here on the San Mateo coast, these girls are just it. They know more than anybody. They have actually written all of the books, as you can see here. So um, obviously, this seemed like a really good location to discuss maritime history on the coast side for obvious reasons. Hopefully, everyone will start to warm up a bit. So without further ado, Joanne. And her but I, I can't begin to tell you how thrilled I am to be here. This this is the first class, docent class, for our new Half Moon Bay History Museum. And I get chills even saying that. Thank you. This, this historic moment. We've been part of this organization since it began. We've been working on different issues and waiting to see this come to fruition. Next year, uh, Julie and I will definitely be part of the docent core. We weren't able to participate in the classes this year, but next year we will. So we're looking forward to that um, in our spare time. We'll, we'll do that too. Um, but thank you very much for being here and doing this. It's, I can't think of anything more worthwhile than doing something for our community. And uh, you guys are all contributing to that, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to point out before I get started that in my highlights, I've probably listed about five um, kind of significant events or milestones. I want to tell you today, I'm going to give you just the highlights of those things because each one of those segments, I could easily give a separate presentation on whether it's shoreway owners or home running or World War II or the landings or the, the uh, shipwrecks or any of those things. And that's just to tell you that there is so much history here that is maritime related. And so if you're interested, delve into it. That's what got me started. And I'm still learning things. So um, just you know, understand that I'm going to give you those those little bits, and then I'm also going to allow a little time for questions, because I really like that part. I always learn something, and, and, and there's a good exchange, I think, between people, so um, we'll do that after I finish. Well, <clears throat> my interest in maritime history happened because I was on my first ship at age three, and that voyage made such a huge impression on me that I've loved ships and stories of the sea and the sea itself ever since. And all the events um, that I'm going to talk to you about today um, are about what I've learned, stories I've learned about the history, the maritime history of Half Moon Bay and Point Montero. And all the events stretched between this five mile coast between both Point Montero, Montmore, Montero, and Half Moon Bay. And this, it's along what uh, author uh, John Steinbeck called the Hard Luck Coast. There were so many events, uh, so many shipwrecks that then we actually named that stretch of coast a hard luck coast. Now our voyage begins with the California Gold Rush. Far more immigrants came by sea than overland, seeking uh, their fortunes as miners and merchants. And many people don't realize that the Gold Rush was essentially a maritime event. So that's, that's also something to think about. Now ships of all types journeyed from the East, east Coast ports uh, to San Francisco, braving treacherous Cape Horn at the tip of South America. That trip was over 15,000 miles. They carried coffee and coal, fish and flour, livestock and lumber, mahogany and molasses, <laughs> pianos and people, rice and railroad iron, sardines and soap, timber and tea, and much more. Do you see that I love alliteration? <laughs> and it's all true. These are all cargoes, and the cargoes, usually people, you know, it's, it's uh, when you talk about cargoes or cargo ships, it's not boring. It runs the gamut. And of course, when there were shipwrecks, scavengers took advantage of that. Well, this increased activity also uh, created new maritime opportunities for many coastside entrepreneurs. One of them was James G. Denniston, and his ranch was centered near what is now Princeton-by-the-Sea. In 1858, Denniston built the coastline's first wharf, and it sat just north of Half Moon Bay on the southeast side of what's uh, Pillar Point Harbor. Denniston loaded his own goods, but he also um, let local farmers and merchants load goods from there as well. 
the area became known as Deniston's Landing, or more often, Potato Wharf, <laughs> because of the large number of spuds that were loaded onto ships, and most of the ships were bound, of course, for San Francisco. Many small schooners came into that little port, and one of them was the 45-ton Black Warrior. It was a frequent visitor to the landing, and on one occasion, the ship's keel was damaged while lying at anchor due to a small earthquake. This was in September of 1859, so an unusual little event. Deniston's Landing also sat on a shore whaling station. One report said, another huge whale came ashore on the ranch of James Deniston, making the third which has come ashore in the last eight months. This is larger than the others. It is a humpback and measures 65 feet in length. It is estimated it will yield 40 barrels of oil. And this became a very lucrative um, uh, business, too. Um, many, as you'll see, many people made very good livings uh, because those huge whales um, were so large and so much oil could be extracted. The station was established in 1861 and moved to Pigeon Point, a neighbor, in 1862. But another one appeared in 1871. It was known as Hatton Bay Whaling Company and it operated in a cove called Whaleman's Harbor. Like most others, the whaling company consisted of one captain, a mate, a cooper, and that's someone who uh, creates wooden barrels and uh, casks, two boat steermen, and 11 other crew. Leadership was provided by Captain Frank White. Now White was born Francisco Alves de Silveira in the Azores, and as was the custom of many Portuguese whalemen, he adopted an American name. But after the uh, season, the whaling season of 1882, uh, he quit the business to become a farmer. And that wasn't unusual. Uh, most of the time, uh, the, sh the shore whalers were actually, it was seasonal. They split their year into the whaling season, and then most of the rest of the time they were farmers. That was the normal occupation. They may have done other things, but that was fairly typical. And then when they finished their careers in shore whaling, they would go on and create their own farms and ranches. But with his retirement came the end of the whaling uh, company here in Hatton Bay. By that time, there were two other landings uh, for shipping operations in this area. One uh, was created in 1860 by James Van Carnap, and he installed a hauser system at Miramontes Point, just south of Hatton Bay. The 55-ton schooner Black Prince and a 116-ton schooner Wild Pigeon often loaded grain there. One report said the vessels approached the shore where a post supporting a loading device could sling cargo onto the schooners. And you can see by the wires here, it was known as loading by wire. And you can see that it comes right on down to the deck, and oftentimes it's not so true in this case because they're loading materials, but they would also attach a hauser to the mast itself. And, and send the material onto the ship. Now in 1868, Je 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 Josiah P. Uh, Ames also established a very successful landing here. It was actually the most um, uh, successful one here in this area. And it was located near present-day Miramar. The pier extended about 500 feet into the water. And then the next year, Ames added another 1,000 feet so he could accommodate larger vessels. <coughs> a track extended down the center of a large warehouse to the pier, and this allowed horse-drawn flat cars to carry grain and other goods to the warehouse, from the warehouse to the ship at the end of the wharf. Now, this process was very efficient, but on occasion it was very dangerous. On once, the heavily loaded flat car broke through the pier, so the cargo, the car, the horse, the driver, all plunged into the water. Now, sadly, the horse was killed, but the driver escaped with his life. Meanwhile, many other ships were out along the coast, and many did not reach their final destination. The first recorded shipwreck in Hampton Bay happened in 1856. Known as a very fast bark with clipper lines, the Isabelle to Hind was part of the China trade she traveled what was then called the Silk Road of the East. She, that, and it, she was traveling from San Francisco to Hong Kong during that period, connecting 
the Far East with the Western world. The sleek little ship carried exotic goods such as silk, ivory, porcelain, gold, and jade. But it was tea that remained the heart of the trade. Now, recognizing that commercial opportunities, um, her owner, Gideon Nye, moved his operations from Canton to Baltimore, or from Baltimore to Canton, I'm sorry. He wrote, the very name of China suggested the romance of history and created imaginative dreams. Unfortunately, Nye's dreams were shattered in 1856 when his most profitable ship, the Isabel Lee Tyne, wrecked near HMV. Rumors swirled around the wreck. One report declared there was a mutiny. The captain and first mate were murdered, and the crew intentionally wrecked the ship to conceal evidence of her crime. Ultimately, it was determined that the captain had been weakened by illness, and the greedy first mate drowned by the weight of his money belt. <laughs> In the 1860s, America was in the throes of a bloody civil war, and President Lincoln ordered a blockade of southern ports. This drastically affected the area's shipment of crucial goods, which included sugar. As a result, the sugar industry was decimated. One report said many fine plantations now lay waste and idle. Well, schooners like the Elfin Knipper carried sugar to America from Peru. And when the ship was wrecked in 1862, Captain Bay resident stole most of that sugar. The cargo that was aboard was 337 pounds. You can just imagine the, um, the swarm of people that must have gone to that ship. One newspaper said this, the sugar was taken to stores in town, but it was dumped out of bags into barrels so it couldn't be identified. And this was a common practice. Uh, wherever there was a shipwreck, local residents would go down to the wreck, gather up whatever the cargo was. It could be sugar, coal, liquor, pianos, I mean, you name it, and they would bring it back into their homes because living in isolated areas like this, that was a boon to their living style and sometimes to the economy, such as the sugar going into stores. So it's not that they looked for shipwrecks, but it certainly supported people in this area and the economy. But, and, and, but, but there are also no what I would call wreckers. People often ask that question, like in Florida, where they purposely did something to make wrecks happen. There's no evidence that that happened. Yeah, good question. Oh, yes. So it's just, I, I mean, I think I was watching a movie or another show or something, and, you know, yeah, a shipwreck would happen, and everybody goes down, especially in isolated areas. Is that assuming that the crew was gone? was lost at sea, or did they? I'm sorry, Janice. The crew, what, when this pillaging um, mm -hmm. was going on, where was the crew? Were they gone? Were they dead? Were they helping? Good question. Did everybody hear the question? What happened to the crew? Were they gone? Did they drown? Were they helping? And the answer is sometimes all of the above. It depended on the, the occurrence. Each shipwreck was different. In some cases, yes. There was such a terrible shipwreck that the, there was no crew left, no captain. On some cases, it might be a few crew members. I remember one story where a sea captain actually took a rope and threw it onto the ship in order to claim uh, ownership of that property. You know, for the yeah, and for um, salvaging purposes. Uh, and he hung on to that and even made kind of a temporary little sh you know shed to sleep in. He and a couple of crew members while the actual salvagers, the official salvagers from the company, came from San Francisco. Other times, um, residents would come down to help the crew, and they would put ropes out and bring them in one by one, or take little dories out if the sea permitted. Sometimes it didn't. Um, other times, everything was just washed away. So there was quite a litany of things that happened during that time. Do you have... Um information or in the stories that you've read, the research you've done, like would a lot of times those crews join the community that they were in if they were yes. in a very small area, far from home, transportation's gone, no more ship, no to get back to the happen. Absolutely. They may have a short stay here or they may come back and that's later in New York. Captain Peabody and his family did that. Um, so some of them did become members of the community. 
um, many of them were continuing to sail, you know, and they were with the company or with the captain, and so they would all be most, mostly sent to San Francisco, and then put aboard another ship or whatever else they might want to do at that time. Others did quit the sea. There was one young man in one of the stories, uh, one of my books, where he said um, it was his first shipwreck. And he said, somehow, and he lost some crewmates, and he said, somehow, I don't want to go back to sea. One wrecking is enough for me. And so that was a terrible traumatic experience for many, you know, especially the young sailors, and so many of them did not go back to sea, and many did. Thank you. Are there any questions? Was that an accepted practice when, when the ship went down to send the yeah, so the question is, was that an accepted? Yeah, was that an accepted practice to descend on the ships? Absolutely. In those days, the maritime law was not what it is, though it really wasn't much maritime law uh, in those days. So it was pretty much first come, first serve, uh, whoever could claim it. Sometimes there were a lot of um, arguments over who was responsible for it in terms of the official salvagers. Other times, people would fight over goods. Or it was a question of, you know, whoever claimed it first, like that captain I mentioned, by just throwing a rope aboard and standing by and saying, this ship is mine. So there were a variety of things, but it was all an accepted uh, maritime practice. In 1865, the passenger ship Colorado was launched, and it was hailed as a floating palace. It was a million dollar side wheel steamer. And she was the largest liner at that time to ever fly the Pacific. The Colorado's inaugural voyage was highly anticipated, and one account said this, flags waved and bands played. The crowd cheered wildly. Salutes were fired from guns on the steamer and on the wharves. She was also the first American liner to carry mail, as well as passengers, across the Pacific to the Orient. After she foundered in 1868 at Point Montera, she flo floated free, but the near disaster left its mark on that area. The ledge where she struck became known as Colorado Reef. And that's just right out here. In 1872, the British iron and sailing ship Aculeo was lost near Point Montera. The captain and crew made their way to shore and began gathering up bits of cargo strewn along the beach. Some of the goods were Christmas toys. And according to one account, Captain McKay salvaged a china doll and slipped it into the arms of the first little girl he saw. Years later, the wreck was captured on campus by noted coastal artist Galen Wolf. He created a series of watercolors called Legends of the Coastland Side, Legends of the Coastland, which depicted local historical events. He immortalized the Aculeo in this this work called The Toy Ship, and it had very personal meaning for Wolf, because the little girl that the captain had encountered on the beach was his mother. And you can see the little doll in this is where he depicts, depicts that. And the larger story of that is that she stayed with the family in San Francisco for years and sat at the table, their dining room tables, um, for every birthday and anniversary. For, for decades. Well, the Aculeo's loss also made a lasting impression on others and, and on, on local officials. And in 1875, a fog signal began operating at Point Montera. And also built reporters for two keepers and their families. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> After the wreck of other vessels, the first light was established in 1900. And it was simply a red lantern, and this kind of happened in many places along the coast, placed atop a pole. And this, but then this skeleton tower was built in 1914. In 1928, a cast iron tower was erected and still stands today. But the significance of this tower was only known recently. Actually, when I was finishing my book about uh, about Point Montera and Half Moon Bay, researchers discovered that it had been moved from Cape Cod, making Point Montera the only lighthouse in America to have stood on both the East Coast and the West Coast. 
Yes. Yes. Uh, so yes, and so this 30-foot tower is a very, uh, it's a very significant landmark for us. It's not open to the public, but I have to say, because of the work we do, we get to go places. <laughs> and so we've been up there, um, and it may look interesting to go into, but most people probably, yeah, you know what I'm saying, probably wouldn't want to go in because it's basically up a straight ladder and then up on the kind of this little, it's not really a catwalk, and that's all there is in there. It's, it's kind of, most people don't want to attempt it, even though it's a small white house, there's, um, it takes some skill to navigate that thing. Now, Point One Terrace Beacon was automated in 1970, and the fourth order Fresnel lens, and it is pronounced Fresnel, uh, the lens was built by a, a French physicist. Um, it's on, the, on display at the San Mateo County History Museum, and it's part of a permanent display called Ships of the World, along with artifacts from the wreck of the Vital Hall and the New York. And as part of the exhibit, I'm the, I am featured in a video highlighting local maritime history. So if you have an opportunity to go, not just because I'm uh, I'm part of it. I was very fortunate to be asked to do that. Uh, but to see some of the, the actual artifacts that they that were collected and given to the museum. I, I'm, I'm one of those people who loves to touch those things. And in some cases, we will be talking about that. And it's a really good opportunity for you or for families to go and enjoy uh, local maritime history. And when the cargo ship Rival Hall crashed at Point Monterey in 1870s, 1876, 10 of the crew perished. Coal and fragments of the ship littered the beach. One man, Chico Gonzalez, gathered up this wooden sea chest, and I had the privilege of meeting his grandson, John Gonzalez Jr., who told me, that old sea chest has been around since I was a little kid. My dad packed it around with him everywhere. As it turned out, that sea chest was a very appropriate memento for his father, John Gonzalez Sr., and he's shown here. Because in the 1950s and 1960s, he was keeper here at Point Montero. Now, the Rhino Hall sunken hulk was rediscovered quite by accident in 1971. Divers John Kempf and Roy Lee were poking around the reef uh, uh, looking for abalone. And they found anchors, cannon, and even the ship's bell. And you can see here, uh, John Kempf is here, Roy Lee is here, and I've, I've talked to John about his diving and, and raising all of this. You can see one of the cannon that's coming out, and down there is the ship's bell. And he said, he told me when I interviewed him, he said, when I spotted a knob sticking out of the pile, I knew it was something special. That bell is priceless. And I asked John the last time I talked to him after the exhibit, which was at San Mateo, that was established in 2014. I talked to John during that period and I said, well, now there's the can, a couple other things you raised there, but um, where's that bell? He said, I still have it. <laughs> so I've got my eye on him to say, you know, you need to donate that someday. Um, I would love to get it for us, but you know, we'll see. Uh, built in 1870, the Alice Buck was an had an illustrious line of mariners that were uh, her captains. And she sailed until 1881. A new captain was asked to fill in for her regular master, but it would be her final voyage. When she wrecked at Half Moon Bay, reports said, the ship struck with an awful crash on the rocks. She bumped five or six times and at last broke in two. Nine of the crew perished. Like the Aculeo, the Alice Buck stirred Galen Wolf's interest. This rendering, called simply the Rack, captures the ship's disastrous end. Now schooners, like the Argonaut, well, there were several different times, types of vessels that we're talking about, and, and not just the famous clipper ships, but um, 
and that sort of thing. They're all in here. That we'll, we have fishing vessels, we have schooners that are the hardworking trucks of the day. We have all kinds of vessels, and that's something that might be interesting for some of you to look into or explore too. I found at first I was in love with these beautiful clipper ships when I started my research, but then I fell in love with these schooners because they're small, they're fast, they're efficient. They did the hard, hard work of building up our, um, our coastlines. Uh, cities and carrying its produce and lumber and that sort of thing. So that's something that I think each of you might think about is, you know, what is it that stirs me? Is there a ship or a person or an event? And uh, do a little extra research. Um, I, that's, that's always what I've done and I kind of really learned a lot. And I'd love to have some of you get a little stimulated and do that too. So again, schooners like the Argonaut were an important part of maritime commerce. They were the trucks of their day, hauling lumber to and from dangerous, what they called dog hole ports, up and down the coast. And dog hole ports were places like Pigeon Point, the harbor, all up, up and down this place, where, uh, up and down the coastline, where there wasn't really room for large piers or large wharfs. And it was said of these tiny ports that there was hardly enough room for a dog to turn in to, 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 to crawl into to the, to, the, to, the port, to the port, turn around, and then crawl back out. Because most of the schooners, when they did that, had to anchor that way because of the existing current. So it was very hard, very difficult work. When the Argonaut wrecked in 1881, Keeper David Splain ran to the rescue. He launched a small boat, uh, bringing the captain and the crew safely ashore. A local election was in progress, and the crew plunged eagerly into the celebration, just as if nothing had happened. Captain Loveville remarked, I've been shipwrecked six times, but never before have I been cast up among so many kind people, so many pretty women, and so much good grub. <laughs> I'm not sure I would have reacted that way on being shipwrecked, but you know, he was a seasoned you know, shipmaster. Originally named the TF Oaks, the New York was one of only three full-rigged iron sailing ships ever built in this country. It was one of my favorite stories. She was also one of the most notorious vessels to ever sail. She was often written up in the Red Record, which was a column run in the Coast Seamen's Journal highlighting incidents of shipboard brutality. The TF Oaks earned the reputation of a ship on which the blows were plenty and the food was scarce. During one disastrous voyage from Hong Kong in 1896, the ship was caught in several storms. The captain was partially paralyzed by a stroke, and the rest of the crew came down with scurvy. Most of them died. The captain's wife, Hannah Reed, took the helm and sailed the ship safely to port. Described as a sturdy, gray-haired, slate-eyed woman of 50, she was awarded a silver medal for her bravery. The ship was sold and renamed the New York, but that didn't change her bad luck. Carrying a cargo from Hong Kong, again, she wrecked at Half Moon Bay in 1898 and sank into the sand. Fortunately, no lives were lost. Now this photo um, is basically taken in the, in the New York, New York wrecked, essentially at the foot of what is now Kelly Avenue. So when you're down in that area, um, um, Many people have gone down there and, and seen that space, but I also, there's a woman I met that had an artifact in her home, and, and she has a view right out to the spot where the shipwreck actually happened. Now, years later, the captain's daughter, Claire Peabody, wrote a book about the many passages that she made with her father, and also about surviving the wreck of the New York. She said, from the first day of the voyage, we had a miserable time. We ran into a storm after storm. The disheartened crew whispered among themselves that the New York was a jinx ship. And also I might say about the, the New York is that uh, many people that we know in this community have, and many of the families, have, still have artifacts in their homes from that particular shipwreck. It was so massive, so big, and it was carrying so many interesting things from the Orient porcelain dishes, uh, you name it, and people collected those and still keep them in their homes. Um, and they also uh, even hauled off the, uh, the, the captain's chair. And so they, they took everything they possibly could. Now the city of 
Florence was built on Scotland's famous River Clyde. For more than 30 years, she weathered storm after storm. And at the helm was Captain William Leask, who he was described this way. It took only a glance at the keen gray eyes peering from beneath bushy eyebrows, the determined set of a square lower jaw, to note a man accustomed to command. In 1899, Captain Leask retired from the sea, sadly after being bashed in the head by a steward who was stealing liquor. He left the deck for the last time and he lamented, poor old Florence, it won't be long now. He lived long enough to see his prophecy come true. The following year, the city of Florence met her demise just 200 yards from where the infamous New York had been lost. The USS DeLong was a Navy destroyer named for the famous Arctic explorer, George DeLong. The ship was thrown off course and plowed into the reefs at Point Montera in 1921. Rescue teams arrived, set up a breaches buoy, and, and, what, what that, and brought the crew safely to shore. And what that basically is, is a pair of rubber pants that um, is, is shot out by what's called a small little cannon called a, a Lyle gun. And they shoot it out to the a line out to the ship. And you guys like this picture because you can see exactly what they're doing. And then they pull that out to the ship, and one by one, people get into that, in this case the crew, and are hauled ashore. One by one by one. So it's a very um, um, uh, kind of arduous uh, piece of work they have to do, but it actually has saved an awful lot of lives. The crew was saved, but the ship was scrapped and used as repair parts for other ships. Now between 1920 and 1933, prohibition was in effect, banning all alcohol. Now needless to say, this was not a very popular law. Many citizens enjoyed a good, stiff drink now and then, even if it was illegal. In 1922, the schooner Grace Harbor ran ashore near Point Montero, but was partially salvaged. It seems she had several brushes with the law. Once the Grace Harbor had 25 <coughs> ports of illicit brew confiscated by local officials, and one December, holiday spirits had a setback when 20 cases of whiskey were discovered hidden in the captain's quarters. Now all this and more happened along this small stretch of coast. I could go on and on and on with stories, um, but the point is there's so much here that we need to learn and keep learning and share and pass on. And there's one thing I would like for you always to remember, and that is that we are standing in the middle of history. So I ask you, think about, look out to the ocean, and give it more than a, pa a passing glance. Think about its ships, its stories, and its people, and carry a little bit of history home in your heart. Thank you. I'll take questions and then sign books if anybody wants to. I've got one question. Um, there's an old wooden structure weathering out at the bluff right now, just where the, I think it's just south of where the Amesport Pier was, um, just south of Murata. Do you know if that's part of the old wharf structure? I don't know. It's got timbers that are like 12, 14 inch square. For a while there was a, a piece, and I've seen pictures of it, there, there, was, there was a piece of the old wharf and, but it gradually deteriorated, and I thought that it had all passed away, but I don't know. Anybody you might want to go down there. It's still weathering out. It, it's being attacked by people, so I don't know how much longer to wait here. There was a, um, a loading pier built on Tanitas at the end of Tanitas. Um, wasn't in your picture, and it sounded like a pretty crazy idea. It didn't last shoot. very long. Gordon shoot, right. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I was just reading something the other day, they said, like you in the picture, the sacks of grain, mm -hmm. and it was so steep, the sacks would burn up by the time the grain got down to the ship. Mm -hmm. The sacks would catch on fire. That's, that's probably true, because of the friction, too, yep. that, that took place. And that's, that's a very interesting point, actually, about the various shoots and so on. I actually have seen a list of that probably it goes on for pages, and it's one line at a time, one line at a time. 
where there were hundreds of that, those kinds of things up and down the coast from one period to another. They were shoots, they were landings, they were, you know, these were the larger ones that were identifiable and that worked, you know, well for a period of time. But lots of those places all along the coast, and they were just to serve a very specific purpose. I think they were on somebody's were, land. Yeah, or, sacks of grain. I think some of them were logs. Mm -hmm. Probably prohibition. <laughs> Probably because we we often know that that happened. There was a story out at the Pigeon Point Lighthouse, too, and I'm sure it happened here. But Pigeon Point had the load, loading my wire effort. So what they would do, like I have a video actually that was in oral history taken by years and years ago that I happened to come into possession of, um, um, of a woman who was the daughter of one of the assistant lighthouse keepers out there, Jesse Migrants, and her name was Jesse, I-E versus E. And she talked about how um, they would see them come in on moonlit nights and actually use the derrick, you know, to load off your illegal liquor. And so that happened all along these places um, because the coves were very accessible, they were dark and isolated, and so it made it easy for them to, to, to do their activity usually without being caught. When was Romeo's Pier um, built? Romeo's Pier? Romeo's Pier, yes. When was that built? I mean, is, is, is that old or that's. Dave, do you remember? I couldn't hear the question. Romeo Mayor's Pier? Which? When, when, when Romeo's Pier, when was that built? Um, the green it was remember? built, of, I think, about 1948, so it's fairly yeah, new. And of course, thing. it's uh, being uh, demoed now. Yeah, yeah. May 24. I think that's the picture you had leading in with Romeo's when you were, yeah. when you were talking about the right. Dennis stuff. See, we don't, and some of these, we don't have some of the images. Most of the images I are either in my collection or came from maritime museums and so on, or from families who I've interviewed. I've done a lot of um, oral histories, you know, lonely family photos and so on. In other cases, we kind of don't have photographs, so we have to kind of give of that period. So we kind of try to find represent, representational um, photographs, and that's one of them I took a little liberty with was just to sort of give a representation when there isn't anything in, in my archives or any other archive I can find. Any other question? Come on, come on. I, like questions. I, got I love questions. Okay. So um, how can we can we find out about how the lighthouse got here? I mean, we know it was two options. I mean, is it is it common to not have any records of how it was transported and we'll just never know? Yes. I, you know, Janice, that's something that has always been very frustrating in doing this kind of work because the period that I'm interested in, which is kind of what I call the historic period, about the 18... 40s to 1940s, in this, I got to do a little more 1830s with the, the one at, at, at point, you know, it's because of the, Cal, the early California history, but that's kind of the historical period. But um, uh, what I found in doing much of that research is records are often non-existent, they are conflicting. If you're looking for Coast Guard records in particular for any period, they may have, they may not be in existence, they may be partial. I know there was a big fire at one point for some of the records for a certain period of time, and um, I've used the San Bruno archives. I mean, I've been everywhere looking at things. And you will sometimes just find pieces of it because uh, there's no consistency. We've also traveled back east. I have a couple of uh, favorite maritime museums back there. Mariner's Museum in Newport News is wonderful. Um, they have the largest um, uh, collection of maritime material in the Western Hemisphere. We've been to Granite Chamberland to, to look at that, you know, their archives. I mean, we've been all over the place to do research. Um, but in this country, when you're looking for those kinds of records and where did it come from, as I recall, the researchers also had partial information. They had a piece that they found that just said, here's where it came from. But we don't know how it came here. Was it by sea, which was possible? Was it by train, which then would have been possible? 
Aliens. They take it apart. <clears throat> they ship it in one. Aliens. I heard a great story. Else. I mean, somebody yeah. visiting one day, and this is just one of those hearsay stories, but you think to yourself, why would a grandparent say this to a grandchild? His grandfather used to paint out here all the time, and he'd mm -hmm. take his grandson with him. Right. And this was the adult grandson telling me this story. He said, and my grandfather used to always tell me, you know, that lighthouse has been around the Cape. Which would indicate it came by ship and somehow yeah. this guy knew about it. Or at least he knew back then already that it had come from New England. Well, and you never know. Sometimes that word of mouth is true. Sometimes or it's and the kids are making them up for the kids. Or, or it may make it a sense to him. To me, it makes sense. Yeah, but the evidence was so thin even linking it to there. I had years before seen an image of the Isle of Mott lighthouse up in uh, Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's where the lighthouse is. Salmon colored, but that's our lighthouse. I, after this whole thing blew up, I researched and found six of them that were carbon copies made oh, from 1879 to 1881 yeah. all around New England. So yeah. this was kind of a, and they often replaced lighthouses that were, like at Wellfleet, that replaced a lighthouse that was kind of sinking into the beach and exactly. unhealthy. And, and that was often the case. So, they would use a certain blueprint. That's happened out on this case. You know, yeah. And I was so fascinated by this fact that there were these six lighthouses. Where were they made? North of Boston, where's the foundry? Because they all had the same little Italianated column. Yeah. I wrote the uh, people who had done the discovery and never heard. You know, just, to them, it's just like, oh, well, it's just uh, <laughs> mass production. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really. Isn't that fascinating? I thought, that's cool. Yeah, well, every, yes. I heard Dave say one time that it's almost impossible to corroborate a story. You know, so so often there are word of mouth that so one person heard, perhaps grandfather. But not. Sometimes the best you can do, um, well, well, two things. First, one, it takes a phenomenal amount of research and persistence. I will tell you that to find the story. Sometimes you get very lucky. Sometimes you really just have to put the time in. Each of my books is two to three years in the making because we, we do the legwork. And we found some places where they actually have real stuff, like even the state archives in, in um, Sacramento. If you want newspapers, early newspapers, that is the place to go. Libraries, other locations, they have pieces here, pieces there. May not be what you're looking for. Huge, huge archive. And they have a huge room, bigger than this, with all the machines. And my favorite thing is they have technicians who can help you <laughs> when something goes wrong. And, and they're right there. So um, that is the biggest archive locally for you know, near us. Um, I think it's one of the biggest ones if you want that. They also have a, and San Bruno archives too. But if you want to do the white glove stuff, they have a history room there too with some of the early materials. Same with San Bruno, some things they'll let you look at. Others, it's the white glove routine because we're so old and fragile. Um, but it takes um, a lot of persistence. Um, it takes a lot of effort. And, and it takes, I think, for me, it's the willingness to say, I'm not quite satisfied with that answer. And you keep asking questions. But sometimes you don't find a better answer. You know, the best you can do is just list the resources that you found and if it's a story, like we're talking anecdotally, so-and-so said, I did an interview with, and they said, is it possible? Or, you know, you might get this story or that story, but like the story of Pigeon Point and how it was named and who named it. It could be one of two different things, but put them both out there. What's the real story? We may never know. So it's, I think you can find you can get at some, some good stories and some truths, uh, but it's hard and it and probably doesn't happen that often that you get the full story. I do agree with that. And to connect the one end to the other, yeah. hardly ever is anybody going to say you're wrong. <laughs> you mean, yeah. oh, yeah. well, they do. No. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about being a woman in the maritime history. <laughs> Um, you know, and I've been doing this for, you know, I didn't have gray hair when I started, but I had to deal with a lot of um, old salts, I mean, serious, you know, and it, it can be very uh, difficult, too, you know, that they, and they will call you out, or you will sometimes have out at the lighthouse when you're doing tours and stuff out there. Some people have 
well, no, that's not the right date, or that's not the or that winch goes that way, not that way. Or I mean, people all have their different interests, and so um, uh, they will do that. Now, maybe this crowd is too polite, but you know, there are others who will. And I think the best way you can do that is uh, not be defensive about it. Just say, oh, really? Or where did you get that information? Or can you help me understand? Or I'd love to do more research on it, or whatever. I'm always open to that. If I miss the boat somewhere, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm always happy to know that so I can follow that next track. Maybe one more question. Yes. So I was just going to say that um, uh, you said that history is happening now or around us, mm -hmm. if I remember. And one of um, when I was at Modesto Junior College, um, which is where I went to school, uh, they had a women's history class, and they only had one, so I took it three times. And um, what I pulled away from that, which was like stuck with me the most, was just that, you know, it, it, um, when we were just talking about corroboration and the things that you can't find the information for, is just to be recording our history, you know, now. And and so like. Uh, there was like a questionnaire that was like three pages long or something, and I interviewed my grandmother, my aunt, my mother then. But it's, it's just important because women's history, now we can finally challenge that, but we, we didn't exist for hundreds of years and that our history wasn't important to, re, you know, to record. But that's the same for anybody right now. We should just, if history is happening now, take the time to write your own story, um, especially in our communities like this where, I mean, a hundred years from now, what we're doing right now will be history about happening. You know, that's an excellent point, and that's something that we've had a lot of discussions about, and that's why I feel so privileged to be able to do what we do. Because it is a snapshot in time, we're lucky enough, and each book actually was researched slightly differently depending on what was available when and where we were going and so on, and also, that so many people after they've seen this or had a press will come to you and say, I have a story or I'm part of a family in which, and you went, I wish I'd had that. Well, maybe at some point in time we can use that. And so it's, we keep building on it. I absolutely agree with that. And quick reference to the women in history. One of the things I strive to do is make sure women are reflected in these books. I know. And, Yes, and because we were there, we are there, there were many different roles. Um, a, a, you know I've done a presentation for, about women in uh, maritime history and kind of tracing it from um, the early days of, and women were pirates, you know, on through uh, being lighthouse keepers, being um, ship captains, uh, being navigators on major vessels. Um, and all kinds of things, so we're able to do that. And I have a lot of fun and a lot of interest doing that presentation because that was another side that we often don't think about, but now we're beginning to be able to say, here's more of that story. And that's true with, it was like um, uh, the Portuguese shore whaling. I did a lot of research on that, and I just gave you a little snippets today, but um, some real fascinating books about that with real names and dates and people who were part of this. And that's another segment, you know, the Portuguese doing that particular thing for any aspect. Um, it's just kind of fascinating to keep building on our history. And Lo, did you have a did you have a question? Oh, well, I did actually have a question and a comment. Uh -huh. um, first, I guess I'll start with my comment, if you don't mind, because I think, and I'm going to just like join you up front for a second. So I just gave you guys some really great docentine advice that I hope everybody heard. Um, you were talking about how you've been places and you've had people get a little, I remember the word you used, I'm going to say surly, and try and, oh, well, that's not the date, and I was always told, and I'm, uh, uh. And the way that she just expressed handling it is, I think, really valuable information for you guys who are going to be the face of the museum. You will get people that are convinced. Um, Dave and I have this running joke about the, like, you know, illustrious pencil factory in Half Moon Bay, which didn't exist. That's not a real thing. But you might get somebody like Dave who's like, there was this pencil factory in Half Moon Bay, and it was that. And it's important to just, oh, I didn't know that. Fascinating. I will do a little bit of research on it. Remember that you're not there to defend 
history, and you're not there to police people and some of their crazy ideas. So I just wanted to thank you, Joanne, for a little bit of insight on docentine. You can always say, shucks, I don't know. I'll look it up. Tell me more, Tell about, me more about it. Give, me, your, give me your contact information and I'll give you Exactly. It. So, Sometimes it will actually be real right. historical. Much like yeah. the illustrious pencil factory of Hasmin Bay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something I'm just going to find into. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, I, just, right, I just want to say thank you, Joanne. I think that's really valuable um, stuff for you guys. But my question, and I'll go back to being an audience member, is I realize it probably changed both to vote, but like with some of these shipwrecks, how many people are we talking about being rescued? Or uh, it, sure. it really depended on some of the um, you know, it, it may be 75 out of 150 died, you know, or maybe 150 died and three were rescued. And on smaller vessels, it really depended on a fishing vessel. There might be five people on a little vessel and there might be 11. Um, it just depended on the vessel, where it came from, what the cargo was, what its purpose was. Close um, to shore, not close to shore. Oh. And that was a key issue. Was it at night? Was it day? Mm -hmm. could, they, you know, could they find shore? Mm -hmm. and, then, and one of the things during that early, the period, too, was, of course, aside from the, techno, the obvious technological advances we have today, was that, Julie mentioned this, you know, there, they, the tendency was to hug the shoreline more because you could see, you could hear the fog signal better, you could see the, the after, after they were built, of course, um, the lighthouses better, you could see the shoreline to some degree to follow it, and so there was a tendency to sail further in than, than there is today. You know, now you're way out there. Um, and so that is a, one of the reasons why there were so many shipwrecks, you know, aside from the current, the fog, human error, you know, just fickle weather and fickle people. I mean, there, we have stories that are true that of drunken captains, you know, or the, or the third mate who's on deck and not paying attention. And you know, seriously, people ask me, you know, are you ever going to write fiction? Ha, I don't have to. <laughs> These stories are amazing and they're true. So um, lots of different reasons for, for, for that. What about that Italian guy who wanted to wave to his girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, there you go. Yeah. Look at what happened. Look what happened. The ship went down. Yeah. Uh, we're still having shipwrecks. They're smaller. I mean, we yeah. have fishing boats ashore. We have sailboats. Yeah, there's sailboats. Just, sail boat. just yeah. last week, there was a police boat out here. Um, I mean, it was yeah. red lights with searchlights doing something. It was way off. So we I have a, a, lot lot of a lot of uh, mostly uh, fishing boats and pleasure boats. But a lot of fishing boats go down out here because they go out in dangerous weather. Um, they, you know, they're close to shore. Uh, they're against these. You know, sometimes I think they go out and don't really think that they're. It's going to be dangerous, but it is. Um, but mostly fishing vessels. When my, my first book came out in November what 2007, and it's had several more publications, or whatever. But. Um, we had a big celebration off the lighthouse in November, and just the night, night, the night before, literally, that we were going to do this celebration, there was a shipwreck out there, mm -hmm. and it was a fishing boat. And so we went down and got pictures. <laughs> oh. and, but it, you know, but it, the fact that it happened right then, and we were inviting all these people in, officials, but also people who were family members, and some who even had folks who were on ships that went down, and I've interviewed some of those people too, and. And it's just amazing. So it just reiterated that, yeah, and that's all kind of part of the future history, probably, if anybody's mm -hmm. going to be looking into it. But it's dangerous um, out there. It's dangerous work. Wind up so wind that wind up. if anybody's interested in buying a book, um, yes. there's not too many. Because I understand we have to be out here by three. Oh, yes, yeah, it's pretty good. Three, okay. okay. So, yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah.